The first reading is taken from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 24, and you can follow this in the Church Bibles on page 993. Matthew 24, begin to read at verse 1. Jesus left the temple and was walking away when his disciples came up to him to call his attention to its buildings. Do you see all of these, he asked? I tell you the truth, not one stone here will be left on another. Everyone will be thrown down. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him in private. Tell us, they said, when will this happen? And what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? Jesus answered, watch out that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name claiming, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pains. Then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death, and you will be hated by all nations because of me. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other, and many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold, but he who stands firm to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. So when you see standing in the holy place, the abomination that causes desolation, spoken of through the prophet Daniel, let the reader understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let no one on the roof of the house go down to take anything out of the house. Let no one in the field go back to get his cloak. How dreadful it will be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. Pray that your flight will not take place in winter or on the Sabbath, for then there will be a great distress, unequaled from the beginning of the world until now, and never to be equaled again. If those days had not been cut short, no one would survive. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be shortened. At that time, if anyone says to you, look, here's the Christ, or there he is, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and miracles to deceive even the elect, if it were possible. See, I've told you ahead of time. So if anyone tells you, there he is, out in the desert, do not go out. Or here he is, in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For as lightning that comes from the east is visible even in the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man. Wherever there is a carcass, there the vultures will gather. Immediately after the distress of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from the sky, and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. At that time, the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky, and all the nations of the earth will mourn. They will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds, from one end of the heavens to the other. This is the word of the Lord. The second reading comes from Paul's second letter to the Thessalonians, which can be found in the Church Bibles on page 1189, starting at the first verse of chapter 2. Concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him, we ask you, brothers, not to become easily unsettled or alarmed by some prophecy, report, or letter supposed to have come from us, saying that the day of the Lord has already come. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. 
He will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped, so that he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. Don't you remember that when I was with you, I used to tell you these things? And now you know what is holding him back, so that he may be revealed at the proper time. For the secret power of lawlessness is already at work, but the one who now holds it back will continue to do so till he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will overthrow with the breath of his mouth and destroy by the splendor of his coming. The coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with the work of Satan, displayed in all kinds of counterfeit miracles, signs and wonders, and in every sort of evil that deceives those who are perishing. They perish because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. For this reason, God sends them a powerful delusion so that they will believe the lie, and so that all will be condemned who have not believed the truth, but have delighted in wickedness. This is the word of the Lord. Dear Lord, it is with humility that we do bow before you this evening. The Apostle Peter reminds us that there are some things contained in Paul's letters which are hard to understand, and we freely confess to you that we come across one of those passages tonight. But Lord, you are a good God. We thank you that you do give good things to those who are humble before you, and so as we present ourselves before your word tonight, we pray you would speak to us by the same Holy Spirit who inspired these words to be written would also illumine our hearts and our minds. And Lord, grant that we would believe them and we would act upon them for Jesus' sake. Amen. Now, it'd be great if you can turn to that passage, to Thessalonians chapter 2. Also, as you came in, you were given uh, two other pieces, <clears throat> two other pieces of paper. Uh, one, this, the, the notes to help you follow through, and also this A4 uh, paper. Now, uh, a lot of things that are balanced, but I'm sure you will be able to manage that. This is what one commentator, Dr. Leon Morris, says about the section we're looking at tonight. He said, this passage is probably the most obscure and difficult in the whole of the Pauline correspondence. And the many gaps in our knowledge have given rise to the most extravagant speculations. In other words, I've drawn the short straw in having to preach from this passage this evening. But since I was the one who drew up the preaching rotor, I've only got myself to blame. But that observation from Leon Morris does serve to highlight the fact that we're all going to have to work pretty hard tonight in order to follow what Paul is saying, in order to get grips with his meaning. Now, let me say at the outset that there is no universal agreement amongst the commentators about the interpretation of this passage. Now, both Lee and Scott have preached on this passage, and I've re-listened to what they had to say, and uh, the approach I'm going to be taking tonight is quite different to both of them. So if you don't like what I've got to say, then you can listen to Lee and Scott, and uh, you can decide which you want to go for. But whatever differences there may be regarding the detailed interpretation of Paul's teaching... Hopefully, the main principles which apply to us all will be clear, so do bear with me. And because this is a difficult passage, I'm going to do something I don't normally do, and that is to give my own translation while uh, roughly following the NIV, okay? So those of you who have got your Greek New Testament, you can check me out if you wish. So first of all, what is the occasion for Paul's writing. Well, we're told there in verses 1 to 2. Now, we request of you, brothers, 
concerning the coming presence, the word is parousia, of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering to him. Don't be shocked off balance, either by spirit or by word or by letter as though from us, to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Now, Paul is primarily a pastor. And like any pastor worth his salt, he is concerned with the spiritual well-being of young Christians. So this is not an academic paper that is written to titillate the interests of those who are keen on futurology. Rather, it is a loving, practical letter to calm the hearts of worried believers. Now, we don't know the details, and maybe Paul didn't either, of the teaching which was unsettling these Christians. We do know that in some way the claim was being made that the coming of Jesus, the parousia, had somehow happened. This teaching may have come through uh, some alleged prophecy or spirit, or it may have come via preaching. Or it could be that some folk were misinterpreting some of Paul's letters, a letter as though come from us, not necessarily a forgery, but certainly drawing wrong inferences. And the mind which is unsettled by wrong teaching is settled down by correct teaching. Feelings which are are, are aroused by falsehood are calmed by the truth. Now, given that Paul had already taught them about the second coming as part of his basic Christianity course, according to verse 5, don't you remember that I used to tell you about these things when I was with you? Why should the claim that Christ has already returned bother them now? Well, I think it's because of what they were experiencing, namely persecution. Chapter 1, verse 4. Therefore, says Paul, we boast about you amongst God's churches, about your perseverance and faith in all your persecutions and the tribulations you are suffering. Now, as we shall see in a moment, integral to Jesus' own teaching about his return, the parousia, is that persecution and tribulation of his followers will mark the end times. And so we read in Matthew 24, verse 9, you'll be handed over to tribulation, affliction, same word that Paul uses here, and put to death, and you'll be hated by all nations on my account. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. Well, that was happening to some degree. And so you can imagine, can't you, some young Christians grasping hold of that teaching and putting two and two together and coming up with five. There's persecution, there's tribulation, so maybe Jesus has already come and and we've missed out on it somehow. That is bound to make you wobbly in the faith. And so Paul tries to settle them down. I'm sure that if they had mugs in those days, he may well have given them one with these words written on them. Keep calm and read my letter. So what is the instruction? Verse 3. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way. For, and here the translators have added something which is not in the original, in order to make sense of an incomplete sentence. That day will not come unless the rebellion comes first and the man of lawlessness, the son of perdition, is revealed who opposes and exalts himself beyond measure over everything that is a god or an object of worship, so that he sits in God's temple showing himself as a god. Now, what's that all about? Now, it's at this point the commentators bemoan their disadvantaged position. Because in verse 9, Paul says... Don't you remember that when I was with you, I told you all this? Well, good for them, Paul. 
They knew what you were talking about. You've already told them. But we don't. And so we've got to guess, and we've got to somehow fill in the gaps. Hence the speculation. Now that is true to some extent. But we have something they didn't have, namely the Gospels. And Jesus' own teaching about his return in Matthew 24 and Mark 13, for example. Now, it seems to me that there are so many parallels between what Paul says here and what Jesus says in those passages that what Paul had done in Thessalonica was simply to pass on to them verbally Jesus' teaching, which we now have written here in the Gospels. And so what we're going to do is to look at Jesus' teaching to help us understand Paul's teaching. It is Jesus' teaching which actually fills in the gaps for us. And to help us see this, I've produced that uh, diagram for you on the A4. So let's uh, take a look at Jesus' countdown to a second coming in Matthew as it parallels Paul's teaching in 1 and 2 Thessalonians. Now, as we had in that first, <clears throat> that first reading, it, with Jesus, it all began with a discussion with his disciples about the destruction of the temple. And they asked two separate but related questions. First, when will this happen, the destruction of the temple? And what will be the sign of Jesus' coming and the end of the age? And so Jesus begins to instruct them. First, he warns against deception about his return. Matthew 24, verse 4. Watch out that no one deceives you. That is Paul's concern in verse 3. For many will come in my name claiming I am the Christ and will deceive many. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Same word Paul uses in verse 2. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. And then Jesus goes on to talk about famines and earthquakes occurring, which are to be thought of as being like the first contractions in labor. But it's not time for the birth just yet. That is what Paul is saying here. Don't panic. Don't be deceived about the talk of Christ having come. There will be tough times, but the end is not yet. Then, as we've already seen, there will be tribulation, verse 9, as well as false prophets who will deceive folk. And in Matthew 24, verse 12, we read, because of the increase in wickedness, literally, because of the increase in lawlessness, same word Paul uses, the love of many will grow cold. But he who stands firm, remains standfast to the end, will be saved. Again, that is what Paul is teaching. In chapter 1, he has spoken of the Christians being steadfast, a sign that they will be saved. The concern not to be deceived in verses 3 and verse 10. And the mystery of lawlessness, which is already at work, says Paul in verse 7. And there will be the spread of the gospel, according to Jesus, Matthew 24, verse 14, which some people think is what Paul is referring to in verse 6 when he talks of the restraint on lawlessness. The idea being that the gospel keeps evil at bay and preserves the good in society, acting as salt and light, the restraint. But there will also be a time of trickery when, according to Matthew 24, 24, uh, people will come performing signs and wonders. And Paul uses the same language in verse 9, which, by the way, is a phrase which doesn't necessarily mean that they are performed by the man of lawlessness, but that his appearing will be accompanied by these things done by others. But there is one 
major, horrible event which must take place. And until that happens, the end will not come. It is a decisive marker which, until it occurs, means that Christians can be absolutely sure that Christ has not returned and will not return. Now, what is that event? Well, Jesus speaks of it this way in Matthew 24, verse 15. So when you see the abomination that causes desolation, spoken through the prophet Daniel, let the reader understand, if only, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Now in verse 4, Paul uses a different phrase, which I think refers to the same thing. He talks of a man of lawlessness, a son of destruction, who will act as if he were a god sitting in God's temple. Now this is key. So what's the interpretation? Well, in Daniel chapter 8 and chapter 11, there's a vision of a blasphemous ruler who will reign for a short time, about three and a half years, and will desecrate God's dwelling place. In Daniel 11:36, it is said that he will exalt and magnify himself above every god and will say unheard of things against the God of gods. Very similar to Paul's language here in verse 4. Now, that prophecy of Daniel had already been fulfilled way back in 167 BC when a Greek ruler called Antiochus Epiphanes IV, which means God manifest, this is a guy who's humble, amongst other things, erected a statue of Zeus and sacrificed a pig in the temple. Now, this led to the Maccabean revolt and a dreadful war. So Jesus is saying, look, that same imagery can be taken up and reapplied to a later event centered in the temple in Jerusalem, which in its turn will lead to dreadful suffering and destruction. And all of this will happen within a generation of Jesus' own lifetime, according to verse 34 of Matthew 24. Within a lifetime. And when you see that happening, says Jesus, run for the hills. And you know what? Christians did. They did that, just that, in AD 70. When after another revolt by the Jews, which began in AD 66, Caesar Vespasian's son Titus entered the temple, which was sacrilege, and the troops are said to have offered up sacrifices to the image of the emperor on the ensigns which were carried in there, after which the troops went on rampage and then totally destroyed the temple. The Wailing Wall is the only thing that's left today. Now, the Jewish historian Josephus tells us that over a million were killed. Now, given that the population of the whole Roman Empire at that time was about 60 million, that is an astronomical figure that was slaughtered on an unprecedented scale. So Jesus is not really exaggerating when he says there will be great distress unequal from the beginning of the world until now. But after that event, says Jesus, AD 70, he could return at any time. But it will be at a time that no one will expect, like a thief in the night, exactly what Paul says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. So Paul is just teaching what Jesus taught. So to recap, Jesus has been teaching that in the last times, which is the period between his ascension and his return, his followers will be persecuted. His followers will be subject to attempted deception by false teachers into thinking he has returned. Some of whom will perform signs and wonders and miracles, as well as there being terrible wars and famines and earthquakes. 
all of which happened during the period of the early church. And all of these things act as the trailer to the main feature, which is Jesus' return, the parousia. But that will not happen until the temple has been destroyed and desecrated. But after that, well, things will go on as normal, as Jesus says in 20, Matthew 24, 37. And then Christ will return at a time no one knows and no one expects. So are you with me so far? Nod or something, just to indicate, okay. So how does this man of lawlessness fit in? Well, obviously, he is tied in with what happened to the temple in AD 70. Now, remember, this letter to the Thessalonians was written around 20 years before that. Therefore, could it not be that just as in the book of Daniel, Antiochus Epiphanes represents the arrogant, overweening pride of the powerful man in rebellion against God, so here... The absolutism of the Roman Empire, embodied in its Caesar with its emperor worship and idolatry, what is called Babylon in the book of Revelation, with its outright opposition to God and God's people as demonstrated by the destruction of Jerusalem and the desecration of the temple, is just one embodiment of all human pride and lawlessness against God throughout the ages, all under the operation of Satan, of course, according to verse 9. So Caesar and his representatives are antichrist. Rome claimed total power for itself and acted as if it was Caesar and not God who ruled the world. And until this appearing happens, says Paul, reiterating the teaching of Jesus, Christ won't return. But after that, we can expect him to come at a time only known to God, like a thief in the night. Now, presumably, 20 years later, after AD 70, the Thessalonian Christians, like all other Christians, were ready for Christ coming at any time. But in the meantime, they were to persevere under trials as Paul was commending them for doing. Do you see? Now, to me, all this makes sense. But what do we do with verse 8? And then the lawless one will be made known, whom the Lord will annihilate by the breath of his mouth and bring to nothing by his outshining presence, perusia. Now, this seems to suggest that whoever this man of lawlessness is who sets himself up in the temple is dealt with decisively at the second coming of Christ, in which case it hardly squares with what we've been saying about AD 70 being the horrible event. However, I can't see how there will be a man of lawlessness in the temple at the time Jesus returns because there isn't a temple to be in. Now, I don't pretend there's an easy answer, but I think a clue as to how this might be understood can be gleaned from the way prophecy works in the Bible. Let me explain. Sometimes a historical figure is taken up as representative of a spiritual principle which can appear later on. For example... At the end of Malachi, it is said that before the day of the Lord comes, God will send the prophet Elijah. And this is taken up in the New Testament as referring to Jesus' first coming, that was the day of the Lord, and John the Baptist being Elijah, Matthew eleven seventeen. 17. Now, he was obviously not literally Elijah, but he was an Elijah-like figure. And so in that sense, he, he fulfilled that prophecy. You get the same thing going on in Ezekiel 28 and the historical king of Tyre being presented as an arrogant anti-God figure. 
And historically, that is what the king of Tyre was like. And yet, he's also representative of other tyrannical anti-God figures that surface from time to time throughout history. So could he not be here? In the Emperor Vespasian and his son Titus, you have the man of lawlessness. The temple is literally desecrated. Blasphemous claims are made for themselves in AD 70. You know, even when Vespasian was dying, his last words were, oops, I think I'm becoming a god. Which was really ironic, given that he was dying of diarrhea. But then after Titus, his son Domitian became one of the most arrogant antichrist rulers who has ever lived, and clearly the main culprit of the book of Revelation. So you see, the antichrist lawless man appears over and over and over and over again. And this will continue until the day Christ returns. And when he does, that will be the end of all such arrogance and pretension and rebellion. All such lawlessness will be revealed for what it is once and for all. And notice here, there's no cosmic battle. The destruction comes simply by the breath of his mouth. Jesus gently blows on him and all other such men... They're gone. They're not so powerful after all. Well, I hope that makes some kind of sense. But what about the application? Take a look at verse 9. Whose coming, the man of lawlessness, is according to the working of Satan with all powers and signs and wonders of a lie and with all unrighteous deception in the ones perishing because they did not love the truth in order to be saved. And so God sends upon them a work of deception to believe the lie in order that all may be judged who have not believed the truth but took pleasure in unrighteousness. Now, throughout this passage, hopefully you you, you couldn't have missed what the essential work of Satan is. It is deception. It's not particularly frightening people, it is deceiving people. So that not only will they believe the lie, they want to believe the lie. They take pleasure in unrighteousness. And God's judgment in the here and now is that he gives them over to the lie they want to believe in. Because they've rejected the truth of the gospel. And friends, that is exactly where we find ourselves today, both outside and inside the church. The rejection of the truth and the embracing of the lie. And people like it that way. Religious people like it that way. And they like it that way because then it is we and not God who sets the agenda. And that is the essence of lawlessness. And so we have the phenomenon called postmodernism, which is really the latest way for human beings to express the rebellion against God and the way things are, by denying that there's any such thing as the way things should be. So the historian Gertrude Himmelfarb, what a great name, warns postmodernism is the denial of the very idea of truth. Reality, objectivity, reason, or facts. It is a totally permissive philosophy. Anything goes, and it is extraordinary how far it has gone. And so when Hillary Clinton is found out as having told a blatant lie, she claims she simply misspoke. But if there's no truth, then they can't be lies, just people misspeaking. But such ideas have the smell of sulfur on them. You see what's happening? God has given over people to believing what they want to believe. So it's now a believer's free for all. 
And of course, while you are in that state, you can never accept the gospel which saves you. Because to do that, you've got to believe it is true. And similarly within our church. The present dean of York Minster, who is strongly being touted as the first woman bishop in Britain, has openly admitted that she is in favor of same-sex marriages. By the way, that is another denial of the truth of God, the lie. She thinks the bishops have got it wrong. And she says she will do everything she can to get around the rules without actually breaking them. Now, where is the integrity in that? But that is the shift we have seen in the church's thinking when it comes to what is considered to be truth and falsehood. You know, William Temple, who was Archbishop of York and then became the Archbishop of Canterbury, delayed his consecration as bishop until he could get it sorted out in his mind that he really did believe in the virgin birth. Truth mattered, you see. But now there is no truth to matter. Except the truth, there is no truth. And so Satan does his work to deceive. And both society and the church unravel as they sink into the kind of lawlessness that Paul is speaking of here. But do we despair? No, we do not. And the reason being is that Christ Jesus rules this world and cares for his people. That is the truth. Jesus is still saving people through the proclamation of the gospel. That is the truth. And one day Jesus is going to return and remove all deceit and those doing the deceiving, whether they be politicians or philosophers or priests. For the days of the man of lawlessness are numbered, but the days of Christ are without end. And that is the truth. Shall we pray? Lord, over and over again, your word warns us, do not be deceived. Do not be deceived. And yet, Lord, such is the sinful human heart that we want to be deceived. We would rather embrace the lie than be embraced by you and your reality. But Father, we thank you for the truth of the gospel which breaks into and demolishes all such deceptions. And Father, we pray that by your grace and the working of your Holy Spirit in our hearts, we ourselves would be molded and shaped by that gospel and that it will be a gospel that will be on our lips and freely proclaim from our lips so that people who are being deceived, who are captive to the lie, will be set free and to know life in all its fullness. For your dear name's sake. Amen.